talk about lung ultrasound in the critically ill patient. A basic introduction to um, future ultra lung ultrasound lectures we're going to talk about. So in this um, overall module, you will be having learning, object learning objectives such as identifying and interpreting signs found in lung ultrasound, be able to identify presence or absence of lung sliding, and use signs found in lung ultrasound to evaluate respiratory failure in algorithm. The last of these learning objectives will be kind of like the culmination of all the ultrasound uh, lectures that you will see over the next couple of uh, modules. So this was a basic terminology. Uh, it was overlooked. It was a free field. Uh, so um, a lot of the terms that you will see here were made sure <clears throat> that they were not any terms used elsewhere in medicine. As a result, you see all these different type of uh, signs, A lines, B lines, Merlin space, uh, jellyfish sign, things that you might not have seen previously in other uh, areas of medicine. So what can you find using lung ultrasound? Well, you can find pneumothoraces, hemothorax, obviously pleural effusions, alveolar consolidations like pneumonias, evaluation for pulmonary edema, and even pulmonary embolism uh, through other measures such as DVT scanning. What are the questions we're asking? In the ICU and emergency medicine setting, we're really looking for our patients who, we're really doing this on patients who are hypoxic and trying to find a reason for why they're hypoxic. You usually aren't using lung ultrasound to confirm someone has a particular pneumonia or a pleural effusion. Most of the time you're using this type of, in the bedside point of care setting in, in the ICU to solve a problem. And most of the time the problem is hypoxia. Now you might say this is a new, new thing that we have not seen a lot of, but actually lung ultrasound has been studied since 1982. And here you can see the different, image, different years, 1982, 1992, and 2002, and the different images and you can see that it's not that the image quality has improved that has started us to use more lung ultrasound in the medical setting. So a few principles of lung ultrasound. The lung is the largest organ in the body, if you look at the skin projection, is 17%. You might ask yourself, where do you apply the probe? Is it the same place that you would apply a stethoscope? There is some uh, recent, uh, earlier articles that showed a thing called blue points. Uh, is similar to EKG or partitioning of the abdomen. It just essentially partitions the chest in different areas. So in most of the lung uh, <clears throat> examples I'm going to show you, I'm going to talk about such as pneumonia, pleural effusions. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to tell you which zones you should probably be looking at. Typically lung, is, lung ultrasound is broken down into anterior, lateral, and posterior zones. You can use a method that Liechtenstein first talked about, which is called blue hands. Essentially, you put your hands with your thumb over your uh, left or right hand, and then you use for your upper blue point as your um, the between your middle finger and your ring finger. And on the lower blue point, you use the palm of your lower hand. I actually use a different area. I put my probe right on the sternum, and then I move laterally one centimeter on either side and I use that as my first anterior point and then I move to the axillary uh, where the arm joins the chest uh, for instance on um, this on the left side of this patient where you see the crease and right there I put my pro probe point and I point it towards the lung and I use that as my first lateral zone so as I mentioned there's an upper blue point which is between the third and fourth finger of the blue hand, a lower blue point, which is the middle of your palm. The phrenic line is the continuation of this line that locates the lateral space. And then a plaps point, which the, the reason I mention is you may see in literature people commenting on plaps point, it stands for posterior and or lateral alveolar and or pleural syndrome. It's really the intersection between the posterior axillary line and a transverse line continuing posteriorly to the lower blue point. Uh, essentially, this is as if you lift the patient up. I'll show some images in future slides. 
So most lung exams can be broken down into stages. For instance, if you're looking for pulmonary edema, you would be looking just in the stage one anterior wall. If you're looking for pleural effusions, you may look into the lateral walls, where we call that stage two. And if you're looking for pneumonias, atelectasis, even uh, er early pleural effusions, you may look at stage three, which is the external part of the posterior wall. You aim from the back towards the sky. Uh, you have really no visual control of the probe, so you would need to use both hands, and you may even need to depress the bed to be able to get this view. And then stage four is when the patient must be positioned laterally or sitting. This can also be studied using the apex. So these are some images just to kind of clarify in your head what I'm talking about. So remember, you have upper and lower blue points. You have a phrenic point, and you have a plaps point. The phrenic point is actually uh, one of the ones I use for like pleural effusions. The upper points is what I use for pulmonary edema. I use a lot, a combination of a lot of these points for pneumonia. Um, and if you can see on the bottom right, the reason why it's kind of difficult to do this in ICU patients is in order to lift the patient to that kind of degree and to get your probe underneath the patient is actually very difficult and the amount of information is limited. So again, how do you hold the probe? I mentioned this in other parts of these didactic modules because it is very important for you to be able to be comfortable when you're holding the probe. Otherwise, you will try to speed up your, your evaluation and possibly make mistakes. So remember, you have to hold it like a fountain pen. It decreases fatigue. It minimizes pressure placed, which is important for vascular structures. Uh, the operator's hand must remain uh, remain very still, especially with dynamic evaluations, such as if you're looking for pneumothorax. Don't hold the probe too tight. This can fatigue you. Remember, another person should be able to withdraw it from your grip. And the reason why I'm very, I, I have a whole slide on this is because if you don't do this properly, you may confuse when evaluating for lung artifacts with your own with your own movements if you're not stable. And this is something we see very often. So remember, the top left is the perfect position that you should be holding it, not the, the bottom right. You will tire out very quickly, and you will not get optimal exams. So in this, in this basic lecture, we're going to learn um, the principal two signs, which is the, the bat sign, and then the A line, and the B line. If you can from this lecture learn those things, you probably have done yourself a benefit. So first, the bat line indicates essentially the two rib shadows and then the pleura. This was originally described in the literature 10-15 years ago. Although it's not so important for you to know the name of the bat sign, it's important for you to know that an optimal view includes both rib shadows and a pleural line and enough depth to be able to check for A lines or B lines. A lines are horizontal lines that project below the pleural line. The pleural line is the first bright white line about 0.5 to 1 centimeters below the rib shadows. Now, I show this image here, which is from 15 or 20 years ago. Obviously, our images are a little bit different now, and I will show you some images from more current times. <laughs> So again, the pleural line indicates the interface between the soft tissues and the lung tissue. The parietal pleura in all cases, and the visceral pleura only when there's no pneumothorax. <laughs> so after you identify the pleural line, the most important thing that you have to identify is lung sliding. Lung sliding indicates inspiratory descent of the visceral pleura against the parietal pleura <laughs> and the expiratory ascent. It does not indicate the visceral pleura sliding against the parietal pleura. <clears throat> so just remember that. So if you have a pneumothorax, you will have absence of lung sliding. But also, lung sliding can be absent in other sticky processes of the pleura, such as pneumonias, ARDS. Also, if the patient is not breathing, you will have absent lung sliding. Observation of the pleural line shows this to and fro dynamic movement. In the past, it was called glittering, shimmering, sparkling, tw twinkling. 
But in latest research, they have been using the term lung sliding. So it's very important for you to familiarize yourself with the word lung sliding. It's better seen in longitudinal scans and your hand must be motionless. The M mode can be useful for data recording, but not required. So the main normal artifact in normal aerated lung or abnormal aerated lung would be the A line. Again, it's a repetition of the pleural line, roughly horizontal, hyperechoic from the pleural line. It comes from air blocking the ultrasound beam. The distance between the pleural line and the A-line is equal to the skin pleural line difference because of physics. <clears throat> so kind of keep an eye where these arrows are, and you're going to see lung sliding. I'm going to keep it on this slide for a little bit so you can get gain the, the visual of what lung sliding looks like. In some young patients, lung sliding may be a lot more prominent than what you see here. And in some older patients that have been in the ICU for long periods of time, this lung sliding can be less prominent. Now, you can barely see the rib shadow on the right side of this uh, ultrasound image, right where the arrow tip ends. But if you're trying to get an image, you may want to show a little bit more of the rib shadowing. As you can see, it will be very easy to confuse the bright uh, hyperechoic lines of the soft tissue if you did not use your rib shadows as a guiding point. <clears throat> this is a slide showing a little bit more depth. In this image, you can definitely see the rib shadows, <clears throat> the rib heads and the rib shadows. You can still see the, the rib sliding, the lung sliding, I mean. And you can see horizontal white lines. And if this is not clear to you right now, don't worry about it. I'm going to show you some other lines that you would be comparing this to. And then I will show slides of both of them in the same picture. So here you see a pleural line with lung sliding with some A lines, the most prominent one with the arrow to it. So in order to show you a little bit better, these are other lung images. Obviously this is not the same as what you saw before, but if you look in the center of the screen, you can see movement. That is lung sliding. You can see on the left of the screen a rib with a rib shadow, and in the center of the screen you can see movement a lot more than what you saw on the previous slide, and that is lung sliding. It's hard to see if there are A lines here, but you definitely can see lung sliding. So the next thing I want you to learn is B lines. B lines arise from fluid air artifacts and give a hyperechoic pattern and up to a completely diffuse white pattern called a Birlo variant. It concludes that fluids traditionally described as anechoic make hyperechoic tones when small and surrounded by air. I'm going to go into a little bit more depth what B lines actually are, but I just wanted to give you a visual image of what I was talking about. So compared to A lines, you see B lines. Well, all I want you to remember is one or two B lines may be normal, but the more B lines that you see, the more abnormal the lung. B lines can show up in a large number of pathologies, which we will discuss, but right now in almost all those pathologies, the more B lines you see, the more, complica the more complicated the problem is. Here's an image of some B lines. You can see the rib shadow on the left side of the ultrasound screen with the anechoic um, shadow. Once you identify vertical lines that shoot from the pleura all the way down to the bottom of the screen, the next thing you need to realize is if there is lung sliding present. If you cannot see lung sliding easily with the depth that you see here, you can zoom in on the actual pleura and focus in on the pleura by decreasing the gain and making everything else dark except for the hyperechoic pleura. So just to show you again, here are two images. On the left you see um, lung pleura with A lines with lung sliding, and on the right you see lung sliding with B line. And in future lectures we will show you a lot more images of absent lung sliding and all the pathologies, but the point of this lecture is to get a grasp of what normal is. 
Here's another image of um, lung sliding. And even though the depth is not there, you can see some bright hyperechoic lines shooting from the pleura all the way down to the bottom of the screen, which would indicate B lines, not A lines. Here's another patient with B lines. In this case, there is no lung sliding. Again, if this is difficult to see when you compare it to the other images, you can zoom in on the pleura and you would see that there is no lung sliding. Here's actually an image of A lines and B lines. Before the B lines show up, you can see horizontal hyperechoic lines, which would be the A. And then at the end of the three second clip, you start seeing some B lines. So as an introduction for lung ultrasound, I wanted you to learn, identify, and interpret the basic signs found in lung ultrasound and be able to identify the presence or absence of lung sliding. The goal of this last this lecture is to identify A lines and B lines and be able to tell between lung sliding and no lung sliding. As we go through the next portions of the basic lung module and the advanced lung module, you will be learning a lot more signs associated with each of the disease processes. And after you learn all those, you will use all those signs to evaluate respiratory failure in an algorithm.